Let's take our Bibles today and open them to the book of John 17. John chapter 17. We're going to be in verses 1 through 19 today. And what we see in the 17th chapter of John is an incredible event happened. Jesus, God in the flesh, prays for us. Now let that soak in for a minute. God himself is here praying for you and for me. That is an altogether humbling thing. That we are in such need of prayer that God would pray for us and that he loves us to the degree that he would actually pray to the Father for us. And what we're going to see today, what I want us to see is the reality that we are family. We are family. You may be here today and you may not have much family on this earth. Your parents may have passed away. You may have no brothers or sisters. You may not have a husband or a wife. But I want you to know that if you are in Christ, you have family. If you are here today, the people that you see to your right and your left and behind you and in front of you are family. If we are in Christ, we are family. And I want us to see Jesus talk about this today, that our hearts will be enriched by it. Verse 1, Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh so he may give eternal life to all you have given him. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the men you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that all things you have given to me are from you. Because the words that you gave me, I have given them. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. All my things are yours and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. Now I am coming to you. And I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word, and the world hated them because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Look at verse 20. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us. So the world may believe you sent me. Let's pray. Father, we all come before you today as a people desperately needing you. We need to hear you. We need to see you. We need to experience you. We need, Lord, your hope to uphold our hearts in these days. And we come together as your people 
need him, Lord, to be reminded today that we are one in you and that we are family through you. And I just pray, God, today that you would impress this upon our hearts and may the ramifications of it go throughout everything we are, that we would lay down every title, that we would lay down every ounce of pride, and that we would see you coming to us in one another and that we, Lord, would be open in our hearts in such a way that your presence comes to others through us. And God, I pray today that if there's any here that came in this morning, not of your family because they've not yielded their lives to you and believed on you, I pray, God, today you would save them by your grace and make them part of the family of God. And we pray all of these things, Lord, in your holy name and for your glory. Amen. You know, my friends, there are many blessings that come to a man who is the pastor of First Baptist Church, Woodsville. One of them you may never have thought of, but I'm going to tell you what it is today. One of the great blessings about pastoring here is we have no cemetery. And I know that sounds weird. Like, why in the world would that be a blessing? Let me explain it to you. Uh, the churches I have pastored in the past had cemeteries. And a great deal of my week was often consumed with people calling me and saying, hey, is so-and-so buried in your cemetery? And I always wanted to say, well, I haven't memorized all the tombstones yet, but let me go check for you real quick and I'll get back. But I behave myself. I never said that. I understand. And there may be some of you here today that are into the, the genealogy and ancestry thing and all of that. Just be mindful if you call churches that pastors have actual jobs they're doing. And uh, there's people that can deal with that. But it's probably not him. People like to know where they come from. They like to know who they come from. They like to know if there's some distinguishment in their past that can be found in their present. We come to know ourselves by knowing our ancestors. Of course, you've got to be careful when you do that. Pastor Mike Minnick tells the story of his mother researching her family tree, and she found a relative named Uriah Minnick from Fairfax County, Virginia. And under his tax record was recorded his occupation, which was written, quote, not much of nothing, end quote. So much for a distinguished family tree. <laughs> Now, we believers in Jesus Christ, we come from good stuff. We come from God himself. By faith, we have been born of the Holy Spirit through Christ to live through him. We are adopted into his heart. We are his. We are his through the Christ and through his blood. We are the family of God. God is our father. Christ is our king and our brother. We become brothers and sisters through him. We are family. All my brothers and sisters and me, we are family. As Jesus said in Matthew 12, 50, whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So it is with us. You, dear friend. Become adopted unto God in the day that you believe. And in that day, you became brothers and sisters with all of us who are adopted through him. And that, that relationship that we have, quite frankly, it is deeper, it is stronger, it is more sure than any earthly bloodlines or any earthly marriage or any earthly adoption you can find. We are family in him. We share the same blood of Jesus that cleansed us all. We share the same spirit of God that indwells us and we share the same father Christ has made us family and he desires for us to be one that we would glorify him now brothers and sisters I believe God has impressed this message on my heart because we as a family of faith we need to come together now more than ever before We need to be one more than we've ever been one before, right now. We are under attack. 
and it is a real attack. Families among us find themselves in the crossfires of our enemy's weapons. We are facing massive, life-changing issues both inside and outside of the church. And God has given us to each other that we all might go forth together as family, revealing his love and truth to all. I believe we need today to renew our view of each other in the faith. We need to seek to unite as one for the good of our faith and the goal of making God glorified in our world. Now, we've just finished six weeks of learning about earthly families. And if there's one thing you picked up there above anything else, I pray it was this, that there is a very serious need for us as families on this earth to go forth in God's design because the enemy is looking to destroy families. And if he is looking to destroy families, you can count on it, friend. He is looking to destroy the family of faith. We cannot let that happen. And we will not let that happen as long as we understand that we are family. And yet we might be a feuding family. We might sometimes be a fighting family. I can guarantee you we are an imperfect family, but we are family in Christ. We stand against our enemy by standing with each other in Jesus. Now, let's hear our Lord as he prayed for us that we might know more about how we come together as family and the great desire of God for us to be unified together in him. We'll begin by looking first today at the reality that we are a family born of Christ. Look at what he says as he begins this prayer in chapter 17. He looks to the Father and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh so he may give eternal life to all you have given him. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times when people read through the 17th chapter of John, they get this impression that Jesus is praying some kind of real gloomy, death and doom type of prayer. That's as far from the truth as you can get. Our Lord's heart is here filled with hope and filled with joy. He knows what is ahead of him. He knows the cross is coming. He knows he's about to suffer the wrath of God on his head for you and for me. He knows that, but he also knows that he is going to be victorious over all sin and Satan and death and hell. And he is looking forward to the exaltation that's going to come to him as he is glorified through his death, burial, and resurrection. And he sees through that resurrection lens a people that the Father has given him. A people that will be born of his grace and of his spirit. Those people are us. All of us who have turned from our sin, turned from unbelief, and turned to Jesus Christ by faith. The cross, you see, is the place of our birth. And don't you ever forget it. The cross is where we originate. We originate where the Son of God takes everything God has against us out on Jesus. That the blood of Christ would cleanse us and forgive us of all of our wrongs and all of our sins in Him. That we would be a people joined together in that blood to be one forever through Jesus. And Jesus says that to know God is to have life, eternal life. Leon Morris, a great theologian, says to know him transforms a man and introduces him to a different quality of living. Eternal life is the knowledge of God. And that life is the life of all that love Jesus and follow him. Now observe with me here that we are accepted in him, that we would accept each other. 
My brothers and sisters, it is absolutely mind-blowing in my opinion how God in his great grace and wisdom can take the many of us and make us family. All of us come together here. We have different backgrounds. We're from different states. Some of us are from different nations. Some of us are white. Some of us are black. Some of us are brown. We are as varied as Joseph's coat of many colors. But yet, through Jesus, we are brought together as one. Out of the many, one. God doesn't care about any of our earthly differences. He doesn't care about your skin color. He doesn't care if you lived in Woodsfield all of your life. Or if you're a second generation that's been here 60 years, but you're not original, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if you're from Kentucky. Thank God for that. He doesn't care if you're from Honduras, the Philippines. He doesn't care at all. What he cares about, this is how he views humanity. He views humanity as those belonging to his son and those who do not. And those who do belong to his son are one in him. And the great thought, the great reality is that God has accepted us warts and all. Therefore, we are to accept each other warts and all. Listen to John explain this in 1 John 4. He says, love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. There's that word again. Big word, propitiation, the sacrifice that carries away wrath. The sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, John says, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. Friends, we have to do that. As we are loved of God, we must love each other. You know, I heard an absolutely heartbreaking story here recently. It's a story about a lady, an unbeliever, that came to a church, thankfully not ours. And she came to this church and she walked in the church. And she, as she walked in the church, she had a, a shirt on that was sleeveless. And all down her arms, she had tattoos all the way up and down her arms. And somebody in that congregation went up to her and said, if you're going to be with us, you're going to have to cover those up. Not exactly the acceptance of Christ, right? Listen, Jesus does not accept our sin. Don't think that he does. But he does accept the sinner. Thank God for that. And as we sinners have been accepted by him, he expects that we will accept each other, warts and all, tattoos and all, everything that is about us, received as we are received in Christ. It can be hard sometimes, I know, but this is the way of the Lord. Friend, does anyone ever disown their child because their child disagrees with them? Does anyone ever disown a brother because a brother disagrees with them god forbid it would ever be that way with earthly siblings or with earthly children how much more should it never be that way with the siblings and the family of god that christ unifies us is larger and greater than anything that can divide us Why? because we are family through his blood and through his spirit and with this let's also observe here that we are loved by him to love each other Look at verse 26 with me for a moment. Jesus prays, I made your name known to them and will make it known. Why? So the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. Wow. That is awesome. What an incredible prayer. Jesus is asking the Father here for the same love that God loves himself with to be in us and working through us that we would love each other that way. 
Now that's family of the truest kind, my brothers and sisters. Loving as Christ loves us means that we are always looking to give ourselves sacrificially for each other. It means that we're not slandering each other or being unkind to each other, but seeking to build up instead of tear down. It means that we are putting down all anger and all malice and all disgruntled feelings at the foot of the cross instead of the heads of each other. It means we reach out to each other. It means that we hold each other together in God's truth as Jesus prays for us in verse 17 saying, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. And brothers and sisters, it means that we are forgiven to forgive each other. Now let me just state this up front in a very clear way. Just so everybody understands this. It has to be blunt. God tells us to forgive each other for a reason. You want to take a guess at what that reason is? The reason is we are going to sin against each other. We are going to offend each other. We are going to bother and bug each other. We are going to do things to get on nerves. We are going to be offended by each other. You're like, oh, man, that just sounds so unchristian-y. It actually sounds very Christ-y. Because Jesus knows that just because we come into this wonderful building, and just because we sit in these wonderful pews, and just because you have a wonderful preacher. <laughs> oh, there it was. That's what I was waiting for. And just because we're opening the book and reading, doesn't mean we're not going to have problems. It doesn't mean we're not going to disagree. It doesn't mean we're not going to sin against each other. Why? Because we're still battling this flesh. We aren't perfected yet. We are going to be perfected, but we're not there yet. And Jesus says, when your brother offends you, you forgive. The teaching of Christ is actually that you be on the offensive. That if you offend a brother, you go and ask for their forgiveness. And if they offend you, you forgive instantly, just as Jesus has forgiven you. Now let me tell you why this is so important. Matthew 6, 15. If you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. And I know that can be hard. I know because sometimes when people offend us, it just gets deep in the heart and we hold on to it. And as one sister here said last week, and this is just radiated through my mind, she said, you know, a lot of times I give something to Jesus and then I take it right back. And I give it to Jesus and then I take it right back. How true. We do that a lot with forgiveness. Lord, I forgive them. Ah, not really. Lord, I forgive them because you tell me to. But I really don't. You know how that happens. We're forgiven to forgive each other. You see, friends, when you go about life angry, unforgiving, maybe just mad and vindictive, what you're doing is you're making this life all about you. If we are focusing on ourselves, we get mad. If we are focusing on ourselves, we get upset. But if we're focusing on Christ, we don't. Why? Because we see that the brother or sister that's offending us has something in them that is hurting them, and they need Christ just like we do. So we instantly forgive and preferably lead them that they may have the same forgiveness and healing. If you forgive like Jesus, you're loving like Jesus. If you hate like Satan, you're living like Satan. Now, it can be tough to forgive like Christ, and here's why. Let's think secondly today about we are a family battling evil. We are a family battling evil. I want you to watch closely what Jesus says in verse 15. 
Jesus is praying for his disciples regarding their lives after his ascension, after he goes back into heaven. And he kind of caps off this whole teaching by saying, I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, the immediate reality that needs to be circulating in our hearts and in our minds right now is that we are going to face evil. We are going to be in a spiritual battle that is so extreme that God himself prays for us about it. If that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what is. If that's not a wake-up call for what you will encounter for belonging to Jesus, I don't know how he could say it any clearly, any more clearly. So let's break this down here by considering first that Jesus prays for us regarding the evil in the world. My brothers and sisters, when we come to Jesus, a radical thing happens in our lives. We suddenly turn against the system that we have known and loved our entire lives and are alienated from it now because we are now in Christ. The Christ we were against all of our lives, all of a sudden is the Christ we are in and the Christ we are for. And that changes everything. Namely, it changes you from not having an enemy to, in the world to now having many enemies in the world. And Jesus wants us to know that this is a war and it is occurring because he says in John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because of this, the world hates you. That's the price you pay for being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're not going to have it easy in the world. You're going to constantly be bombarded with sin and wickedness and evil all around you. And they're not going to like you at all because you love him. And they're going to seek to tear you down because you're built up in him. We are battling this evil everywhere. The spirit of the world is dominated by Satan, who is the original hater of God. And he will oppose anything that is of God, especially God's family um, faith. You can well expect that the way of the world, the things of the world, the mindset of the world will be against you as you seek to live your life for Jesus, but take heart. You do have a mighty refuge in Christ and in the family that he has made you to be part of. Now let me show you where the rubber meets the road with this in practice as we consider here also the evil in our hearts. It's there, and sadly, my brothers and sisters, we all have to acknowledge that we simply are not perfect yet. I will fail you. I've told, I've told you that from the day you interviewed me here. I will fail you. And I know you will fail me. The good thing is, your worship is not to me and my worship isn't to you. It is to Christ who never fails us. You know, I heard this last week, this, this very painful story. A man came into church and we're talking and he shares with me that uh, he doesn't he doesn't come to church here. He doesn't attend church here because when he was younger, the church he grew up in, he said they were just full of hypocrites. He said, I, I would see people act one way on Sunday and act another way on Saturday. And he said, I just I just couldn't stomach it, so I just sort of just sort of done away the church altogether because of so many hypocrites. Okay. Now, bear in mind, he joined the military, and I'm sure he was around no hypocrites there. And then he got into the workforce, and I'm sure there were no hypocrites there. But church, there's hypocrites, so we're not going to do that. And I, I get where he's coming from. I understand his argument. He simply just doesn't understand how this really works and what this family really is about. So I shared with him. I said, oh, man, I'm one of them. And he, he looked, and I could tell it was a look of, say, huh? And I looked, and I said, look, man, you know, I fail God all the time. 
I am by no means perfect. I need the forgiveness of Christ every single day. I fall so far short of his glory. The guy was like, oh yeah, well, we all do. <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> the thing is, we come here as family knowing this. When I look out at you, I'm not looking out to wonder who's perfect among us this week. I know none of us are. But we look to Christ, and he is perfect. This is a hospital for the unrighteous. We battle sin, and it can be tough. We battle Satan, and it can be tough. Listen, listen to how John gives this to us in 1 John 3, though. He says, do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we loved our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. John is saying, John is saying that we will know that we are standing against Satan, and we're standing against our flesh, and we're standing for each other by our love one for another, because that only comes from Christ. We we know we have passed out of death. By the proof of our love to one another. Because if we don't love each other, we have no life of Christ in us. But having that love, we know we do. And therefore, we know we have passed out from death and into life through Jesus. And it's only when we are living and walking in him that his love will manifest from us one to another. And this love is the only way we will overcome the evil in our world and in our hearts. This is a love that walks us in truth and frees us to serve Christ by selflessly giving ourselves one to another. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 23. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made completely one so the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Listen, my brothers and sisters, the unity that Jesus is praying for us to have is a divine unity that can only come to us through his divine love. A man named R.B.G. Tasker says that the perfection of this unity, our oneness, will only be reached so long as believers keep in touch with their exalted Lord. Tasker's right. If we are going to have this unity that Jesus prays for us to have, it will happen only by each and every one of us maintaining ourselves in Jesus so that we might love each other as he loves us. But you break from Jesus, come on, you're going to break from your brothers and sisters in Christ. If we base our identity on anything other than Jesus, what will happen is the church will be filled with warring partisans instead of unified brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's remember that when war marks our mindset and ministry more than Christ, being Christ, you belong to one another in love, and we know this love how? By walking in him every day and coming to view each other as he views us so, so precious that he gave his blood to redeem us for himself. One man describes how this looks in the church when it happens. He says, quote, the divine unity of love that is referred to here makes all wills bow in the same direction, all affections burn with the same flame, all aims directed to the same end, one blessed harmony of love. We are family, brothers and sisters. A family of faith, a family of love. And I want to encourage you in something huge here. Don't Deny yourself the means of God's grace to you through this church family. If you are hurting or you are struggling, 
You come to me. And if you say, well, I would, but I really don't like you, preacher. Fine. <laughs> Go to one of my deacons. And if you like, yeah, I really don't care for them either. Fine. Find somebody in these pews that you can look to and say, hey, can I take just a minute of your time? I really need to bear this burden to you. When you isolate yourself, and if there's ever a time we have seen this, it's here lately. If you isolate yourself, you are putting yourself on the path to complete devastation. Do not let the evil one trick you into thinking that you can do this on your own. You can't. Do not let the evil one tempt you into believing that you can be right with him when you're not right with your brothers and sisters. Do not. Do not give up this massive means of God's grace that we can look to each other and say, brother, sister, help me in my heart. This is what is happening. And see God work through them to be your comfort and to be your strength. You do understand that's how it works, right? He works through us to bless each other. We are his instruments of that happening. Be led of the Lord in love and in truth. For we are all part of something bigger and greater than ourselves here. We are part of something bigger and greater than all of us as a whole. We are here to be part of the kingdom of Christ and the making of Christ known in the world. If you are saved from the wrath to come by being born again through turning to Jesus by faith, you are of this family of God. Use every privilege of God's grace in it. Every right that you have in him for your benefit and his glory. Now, what if you're sitting here today and you, you've heard me repeatedly say, brothers and sisters. You know, somebody somebody called me out on that one, one time here. They they said, hey, we, we always realize that's... Uh, you're calling everybody brother. Or you're calling everybody sister. And they say, why do you do that? And I said, I, I do that because it reminds me of who I'm dealing with. When I call you brother, I, I'm not joking around with that. You are a brother to me in Christ. When I call you sister, I'm not playing around. I'm, I'm looking at you as one born of blood, just like me. The same blood. And then he said, oh, well, I thought it was because you couldn't remember our names. No, I can remember your names just fine. Thank you. See, that was a moment you had to forget. But what if, what if you are sitting here today and you hear me saying brother, you hear me saying sister, and, and you're hearing what I'm saying about being part of this family of faith, and you're just looking at your life and you're like, you know, I'm not. I'm, I'm just not. I'm, I'm here among these people today, but I'm not of these people today. I've got great news for you. You can become part of this family of faith just like we did. And how we did it was this. We were convicted of our sin, and we looked to Jesus, and we asked him to forgive us, and we put our faith in him. And in that moment, we were born again and instantly part of the family of God's in all the world. Amen. And you can have that right here, right now, today. Would you bow with me for just a moment and prayer? Our musicians are going to come and we're going to have this time of invitation. And if you today would like to follow Jesus, to repent of your sin and come to him and be made part of this great family of God, then go to him in your heart. Call upon his name. Ask him to forgive you. He will. Ask him to receive you. He will. And if you do that, I'm going to ask you to come and meet me at the end of this aisle when we stand and sing. Nothing magical happens by you coming down this aisle, but what does happen is you come to confess to us all that Jesus Christ has saved you today and you are a member of this family from this moment on. Father, 
I come to you in Jesus' name praying that you would increase your family today, that you would save lost souls among us, that you would bring them to yourself. And God, I pray for we who are of your family that we would take this word today to heart and view each other with new eyes and a new vigor to live out this family and this family life that you've given us. God, work in this invitation now. We give it to you. Glorify yourself through it. We pray, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.